we present The Higher They Fly, a novel by Christopher Hodder Williams, freely adapted for broadcasting by Norman Edwards. The play opens in London Airport Control Tower. Ministry of Aviation Watch Supervisor Scrivens here. What? Or oh, what sort of gear? Oh, very well. Come to my room and report. Well, Scrivens, I'll be on my way. Well, goodbye, Captain Fleming. Oh, you can drop the captain. Hmm? Surely you know that I've been grounded. Not allowed to fly anymore. Oh, no, I showed the sorry. white feather on a check flight and had to let co-pilot Truman land the plane. There's no secret about it, is there? No, I'm, I'm sorry. So am I. Very sorry. Especially because I can't remember a thing about that flight. Amnesia. You're not well, Fleming. Sick leave's what you need. And the sack is what I'll get. Come in. Ah, Forbes. Now, what's all this about finding gear? This is part of the stuff, sir. I found it on the perimeter track as I crossed over by the boundary lights just after the last jet got off. But this is a piece of main undercarriage lock. Anything else? Well, there's the remains of a wheel out there and some other odds and ends. You didn't see the wheel fall? No, sir. Too dark. Well, Captain... Oh. Uh, Fleming. How bad is it? I'm grounded. I don't count anymore. If you're an engineer as well as a pilot, I'd value your technical opinion. How bad is it? I don't know yet. But I don't think the pilot can get down. But he must. Seventy passengers. What you're holding, Scrivens, is part of the hydraulic gear from the undercarriage. You'd better let the radar room know, because if the owner of this bit of gear tries to get his undercarriage down, he won't be able to get it up again either. Well, as long as he can get it down, I can't say how that matters. Oh, well... Well, he's only lost one wheel out of a total of eight. Well, you'll see what I mean when you have a look at the drawings, and then... I... Uh, 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 Fleming, you all right? Uh, uh, yeah. hey, yes, I, yes, I'm all right. Oh, I thought you were going to faint. Uh, you're in bad shape, Fleming. I'm a lot better off than those poor devils up there. I must radio the pilot. Oh, I'd like to help. Yes, Fleming, but I can't allow you to intervene officially. It will be up to the pilot to decide what to do. Yes, I suppose so. And I forgot that I'm the big failure around these parts. Oh, this is no time for self-pity. Forbes, sir, uh, get along to the radar room, give them the facts, say I'll be along in a jiffy. Very good, sir. Fleming. Yes? Speaking unofficially. Yes? You checked flew that jet for a year ago, didn't you? Yes. I suppose you know that aircraft inside out. As a matter of fact, I do. But I certainly don't know how to land an aircraft that size with an undercarriage that's going to be at right angles to the line of flight when the pilot lowers it. Between you and me... What do you think the pilot should do? Well, all I can say at this stage is that he may have to try a belly landing and hope for the best. Hello? Hello, Woodford. Yes, Fleming's here. He wants to speak to you. Oh. Hello? Uh, Robert, uh, Ken Woodford here. Uh, I'm in the country. Air traffic control phoned me just now and told me about the Jet 4. Oh, why the hell didn't you phone me yourself? I... I, I don't know. Now wake up! What the devil's the matter with you? This is a matter of life or death. Well, I, you must help. I, I don't see what can be done. Uh, nor do I yet. But you know as well as I do what the chances of getting a jet four down on his bare belly. It's just about nil. They'll have to do some engineering in flight. Oh, you're out of your mind. Oh, possibly. Uh, now, listen. Um, I get hold of the drawings and work out from them what can be done. But how can they work on the undercarriage? They can't get near it. Well, they can get into number three systems bay and then smash their way through the floor. Now put Scrivens on. Uh, he wants to talk to you again. Scrivens here. Uh, Fleming has just left the room. He's not feeling well. He's not feeling well, but... Look, you'll have to use him, Scrivens. I designed that aircraft, and Fleming knows it inside out. I'm sorry, Mr. Woodford. Fleming is in no shape to help in this situation. Uh, Scrivens, I would remind you that Fleming flew the check program for undercarriage endurance. As well as being a line captain, he's a creative engineer in his own right. Are you trying to tell me you don't need him? I tell you, the man is ill. He doesn't know what he's doing. 
In my opinion, he's the only person you're likely to get hold of tonight who can assess the trouble technically and advise the captain of the Jet 4 on the best landing technique. Now, if you can't handle him and get him to help, then God help the passengers and crew of that aircraft. I'll do what I can, but it's obvious to me the fellow's on the verge of a breakdown. He's been going about in a half dazed condition since he cracked up during that check flight and Truman had to take over the controls. Yes, yes, I, I heard about it, but I must say I don't understand it. I've known Robert Fleming for a good many years, and he's the last person I would have thought to behave as Truman said he did. Now, what's your personal view? Well, if, if there's anything in rumor... Now, what rumor? Well, it's just catty gossip, I expect. Now, tell me to hell with tales out of school. This is an emergency. Whatever the gossip is, it may be a clue to Fleming's incredible behavior. Well, come on. Out with the scrivens. Well, it concerns Fleming's girlfriend. Uh, Julie, yes, yes. I, I admit her. What about her? Well, I said that Truman's been poaching. Successfully? So rumor has it. Uh, you mean Truman has a reputation as a Don Juan, hasn't he? I believe so. Yeah, so do I. Uh, now, listen. I'm stuck in the country, but keep in touch. But use Fleming somehow. He's your only chance. Uh, keep me informed, please. I'll do all I can, Mr. Woodford. Hello. Oh, Talbot, yes, I'm coming to your office now. Have you found out which plane? Oh, you have. State lines 46, London to New York. Have you made radio contact? Or what's the captain say? What? He's not sure. Well, my God, if he's not satisfied. Uh, Talbot, I'll be with you right away. I want to talk to the captain myself. you, Mr. Hub. Oh, now I come to think of it, yes. Mm -hmm. There's a new club in New York you'd love. How about a date? I'm sorry, but a stewardess isn't allowed to have personal associations with passengers. Uh, do you always stick to the rules? At times, Mr. Hub, the rules suit me very well. Look, how about a martini? <laughs> Thanks. Good for my damaged ego. <laughs> Anything for you, Dr. Rogers? No, thank you. Ah, so I'm sitting beside a lady doctor. Correct. And over there is the famous actress, Jane Tyne. Really? Mm. She's great. I hear she's opening a new play on Broadway. Ah, glad I didn't economize and fly tourist. I've heard there's not a vacant place. Is that so? Mm -hmm. Seventy people in the next cabin. Quite a load. Say, who's that big geezer over there talking to the first officer? I think I heard the stewardess say he's a Mr. Valentine, uh, a businessman from London. He's sure been knocking back a lot of whiskey. So I've noticed. I think Mr. Truman is trying to persuade him to go easy. Truman? Is that the first officer's name? Yes, Jimmy Truman. I've been told he's co-pilot on this flight, and a very good one, too. Uh, maybe. I don't like his blonde hair or his face. Why? Oh, he knows he's a good-looking guy. Oh, but charming, don't you think? Charm. Polished. <laughs> professional Romeo. As a matter of fact, I think you're right. But I'd rather have to deal with him than Mr. Valentine. I wonder what those two are talking about. Of course, Mr. Truman, it's all very different nowadays. The day when I had my own plane, one really had to know how to fly. Really, Mr. Valentine? Yes, really. As far as I can see, you chaps had pretty well nothing to do. What? Autopilots, altitude locks, course locks, and God knows what else. Piece of cake, eh? But, of mm. course, this is, this is not the airline I usually travel with. I hope it meets with your approval, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Truman. Ah, hello, Susan. Want me? No, Captain Crook wants you up front. Oh, Excuse me, Mr. Valentine. Oh, that's all right. Ha-ha. <laughs> Susan, my girl. Yes, Mr. Valentine. I've got another of my favorites. Just a double and just a dash of water. Just show the bottle. Very good, Mr. Valentine. No need to say when. Hurry up, my girl. Hurry it up. Perfect idiots, Jimmy. That's what they are. Why? And who are they, Captain? I've just been talking to Scrivens on the RT. He wants to know if we still have an undercarriage. What? <laughs> what do you think, Jimmy? Any wheels down there, do you think? Huh. It seemed all right at takeoff. You notice anything, Jeff? Huh? Five degrees right, Captain. 
Yeah, where are we going, Perkins? The Tate Gallery? There's a <laughs> beam wind picking up all the town, Captain. Mm, right, all right. Five degrees it is. Now, repeat. Did you notice anything at takeoff? Well, I had a vague feeling that something hit us. A sort of thump. I oh. felt it rather than heard it. Yeah? I'm sorry, I should have mentioned it to you before. No, no, forget it. Wouldn't have made any difference. Look, do you think you could get your great body through a very small hole? The servicing duct. Number three systems bay. Oh, I'll try. Tight squeeze. I'm the fat boy of Peckham, you know. <laughs> now, listen. If we have hit anything, you should see that the hull has been dented. In number three bay, you'll be right above the retracted wheels. Yeah. Now, uh, if that's where the trouble is, there may be some damage visible from the inside. Yeah. Meanwhile, we must depressurize. Airways have authorized us to go down to 10,000 feet. Yeah, well, I'll have to tell the customers. Pass the microphone, Jimmy. Yeah. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain speaking. We are going down to an altitude of 10,000 feet, and I am about to depressurize the aircraft. You will probably find no difficulty whatsoever in breathing when I uh, let the wind out, so to speak. But if you do have, you've only to press the red button above your heads, and an oxygen mask will drop down. There is no cause for alarm, but one of my crew will be inspecting certain equipment. Please do not smoke, although you may move around as much as you please. I shall be making a further announcement later. Thank you. Well, Dr. Rogers, what do you make of that? A jovial understatement, Mr. Hunt. Yes. Even at Yale, I got to know you British love understatements. Losing 20,000 feet in order to depression. Yeah, I wonder what the trouble is. Flaps, undercarriage? I don't know much about aircraft. Nor do I. But this one has a bug in it somewhere. The captain was too offhand. Stewardess? Yes, Dr. Rogers. Can I get anything for you? Your name is Susan, isn't it? That's right. Susan Eccles. Oh, stewardess. Too so... formal. Susan it is. <laughs> Fine, that's okay by me. Do you know what the trouble is? Trouble? Oh, there's no trouble. Captain Crook is one of our most experienced pilots. Rather than leave you in the dark, he prefers to let his passengers know what is happening. Stewardess! Stewardess! Hey, my girl! Oh, servant! Dear. Servant! Empty glass! Come, Come in, on, sir! Girl. Julie, what are you doing here? Ken Woodford phoned me at my flat. Oh. He can't get to London. He asked me to come to the airport and see what was going on. Oh, did he tell you what's happened? That I'm sick? Yes. But it depends how sick you are, Robert. You probably talked yourself into it. You'd be sick indeed if you couldn't pull yourself together and do everything possible to help. I can't do anything officially. They won't let me. How long have they got? What are you talking about? Fuel, I mean. About eight hours. What they must be going through. You don't care, do you, Robert? You're too wrapped up in your self-pity. You haven't the imagination to understand how I feel. Well, you hate me, don't you? Because of Jimmy Truman. You betrayed me for him. Oh, don't be so melodramatic. I fell in love with him. Do you know that the aircraft in trouble is State Lines Flight 46? No. Ken Woodford didn't tell me that. The pilot is Captain Crook. The co-pilot is your Jimmy Truman. Oh. Oh, I think I'll leave you now. Ken Woodford may be able to reason with you. I can't. You could try. I'm a good listener. You know the only thing you're good at in your present twisted state? What? I've got to see Greg in a minute. He might like to know, too. Hating. The thing that counts, Fleming, is the doctor's report. I discussed it with the board this morning. Yes, well, Greg, you are my boss. Are you going to sack me? No. You're valuable to us as a development engineer. But I am grounded. You're unfit to fly. But I'd like to see the doctor's report. No. The doctor feels you should see a psychiatrist. Oh, that's out of the question. <laughs> what a triumph for Jimmy Truman. He's proved in his report that I'm a coward and an invalid. Invalids... Don't fly. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait, uh, wait, uh, uh, Fleming. <sighs> Sorry. I thought my memory was coming back. 
Just for a moment, I remembered. What? 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 Only that Truman lied in his report. He was the one who panicked. Go on. Yes, he... He... <sighs> no, I can't. It's all blank again. Amnesia caused by shock. And the doctor says your memory will return in time. In time. How long, oh, Lord? Fleming. Yes? What's your opinion of Truman as a pilot? First rate. But he has his cracking point. Flying with him is an act of vanity. He sees himself as a Greek god flying. I wouldn't care to be with him again when he feels that image being destroyed. You want him to be destroyed, don't you? I mean, as a man. Because of Julie? Probably. Sorry. Excuse me. Surely. Hello? Yes, Scrivens, he's here. Hold on. Fleming, the captain of State Lines 46 wants to talk to you. He's on Atlantic shortwave radio connected to this phone. Now, here you are. Thank you. Take a grip of yourself and talk to him. So that's what I propose doing, Fleming. Hmm? Yes. I'll call you again as soon as I know the result of the inspection in systems bay number three. Over. Have uh, you ever met Fleming? Hmm? No, 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 Jimmy, no. Heard a bit about him. Good engineer. Knows these jet fours inside out. Yes, yes. Sounded a bit, um, jerky on the RT. He's been grounded, you know. Uh, lost his nerve. Yeah. So I heard, Truman. Yeah. <laughs> well, now go and have a look at the customers, Jimmy, will you? Say a few yes. nice words to him, necessary. I will. And I'll cut Mr. Valentine off the booze. Uh, if he doesn't behave. Do that. Valentine's thirsty again. Mm. Looks scared, too. He's the type that panics. We may have trouble with him. Stewardess! Mm -hmm. Stewardess! Coming, sir. Can I get you anything? I want the other stewardess, not you. I'm afraid she's busy at the moment, sir. Young woman, I'm used to getting what I want. Get me a large whiskey and hurry. Very good, sir. Susan. Yes, Dr. Rogers? Can I get you anything? No, but don't let that creep get you down. I'll handle him for you, if necessary. <laughs> Thanks. He's scared, you know. And that makes him worse. He's one of those men who make you feel quite naked. But I've met his sort before. I can manage him. Oh, I wish I knew a girl who would manage me. Well, that shouldn't be difficult. Hello. Here's our handsome Mr. Truman again. Oh, I wonder what's cooking. He looks worried. And nervy. I wonder how the captain's feeling. Captain Crook has a first-class reputation, sir. Excuse me. Oh. Loyalty. Mm, I like her. Me too, but if she calls me sir again, I'll burst into tears. Oh. What's that? I'm just Valentine again, ringing for service. Oh, he would. Gee, I'm beginning to dislike that guy. Perkins. Yes, Captain? You're a very good navigator, my lad, but must you eat those filthy bananas? <laughs> I like bananas, don't you? No. I was frightened by a banana at the age of two. <laughs> <laughs> now, how long can we stay at 10,000 feet and still have sufficient fuel reserve? Well, at this altitude, we're eating it up. Yeah. Uh, but if we fly at our most economical speed, uh, say 230 knots, we can still make Gander and the alternate if we go back to cruising altitude within two hours. Well, hmm. You'd better plot a course back to London Airport, just in case. Right, sir. Cut back speed to 230 knots. 230 knots it is. Well, Jeff, are you ready? Yeah, just about. All those sweaters and things you're wearing won't improve your chances of squeezing yourself through a hole into number three systems bay. Yeah. Well, it'll be about minus 30 centigrade down in the bay. Cold. All I want you to do is to have a quick look. Now, no more. Oh. We've been warned not to lower the undercarriage, so we can't study the mechanism by operating it, so this is the only way. But if I don't see anything wrong, sir, it won't prove there is nothing wrong. No, I know, I know. Well, we'll have to think again when you get back here and make your report. Off you go. Yes, sir. Oh, and uh, good luck, Jeff. I'll be seeing you. Jimmy. Yes, Captain. I have a feeling Jeff won't make it. He's too big, too fat. He won't squeeze his way along the tunnel. No. Now, you're much slimmer than Jeff. No, if uh, Jeff can't make it, I'll have a go. Good boy. I've never explored the bowels of an aircraft before. <laughs> Hello, here is Jeff. 
Soon back, Jeff. Yeah, I couldn't get through. But there's trouble, all right, sir. What's happened? I don't know exactly, but when I opened the pressure hatch in the floor, just forward of the first class cabin, there was a hell of a slipstream. So there's a hole somewhere. Yeah, there must be. There's a howling gale down there blowing along the tunnel. All right. Up to you now, Jimmy. Yeah. But if there's a hole, don't fall out. I lose more first officers that way. <laughs> You're forgetting, Captain. Uh, my father was with the Flying Circus, too. All right, Coggy, all right, on your way. Huh? All right, sir. Well, now I must say a few more sweet nothings to reassure the customers. Hand me the mic, Jeffrey. Sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I thought you'd like to know that our routine check is proceeding satisfactorily and that I hope to return to our normal cruising altitude very shortly. Meanwhile... Two hundred and thirty knots is indicated, sir. Slower than a dead dog's funeral. Good heavens, are you eating another of those filthy bananas? <laughs> First officer back, sir. Now, Jimmy, did you get into the system's bay? Yes. Trouble? One wheel missing from the port side, Boki. What? Camshaft gear missing. Bits of tire tread all over now, the now place. Now, take your time, Jimmy. Easy, easy. I want to know in detail about the damage. Jordan! 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 So that's that. Is that all, Jimmy? Quite a belly full. Quite. We're probably committed to a belly landing, too. Or ditching. How lovely. Jimmy. Tune the VHF to 1260. If we turn back, I shall want to talk to Shannon as soon as we're in range. Very good. Truman, are you all right? What do you mean? Nervy, aren't you? No. Then listen, I said tune to 1260. Well, that's what I've done. No, you haven't. Take a look. You should know the Shannon frequency by now. What's the matter with you? Damn you, I made a mistake. And I do not like people who pick on me. Sorry. I... Uh, I want to apologize. There isn't time for that. And it won't alter the contents of my report. I realize that. Now get out. I'm going to talk to Fleming again on the radio. It won't help him to know that you're listening. Look, I... You want something to put in your point? Put this! Put it in your point! Simmons, Get out of here! Get out of here! Uh, Truman now? In the after cabin, sir. Hmm? Dr. Rogers has given him a sedative. He won't give any more trouble for a while. He damn near had us in the drink. Yeah. It's a marvel the elevators didn't break. Yeah. Here, what did you make of it, Bergen? Oh, mental, if you ask me. Gone off his nut. Mm -hmm. I thought for some time that Truman was boiling up for something. Just now was his breaking point. Sending him into number three systems, back. And a shock when he saw the damage. Yes, and knowing a detrimental report would be made by the captain. Oh, hell, I'd never have reported him if he'd pulled himself together. Oh, Perkins, go and have a look at the customers, will you? Tell them, um, tell them, uh, oh, air pocket stuff. Reassure them, eh? I'll talk to them later. Very good, sir. Now, Jeff, this is what we do. We beat it for home. I'll talk to Fleming in a minute about my plan A. Plan A, sir. Yes, plan A. To ditch this aircraft in Southampton water if it's not too choppy. She'll break her back. Yes, but there's a sporting chance she won't pitch over. Now, plan B, if the sea is rough or for any other reasons, I'll belly land her at London Airport. It's a nasty bang and all that, but, well, you... you never know, do you? <laughs> There'll be lots of foam available and ambulances. Very impressive if we make it. Why, we might even get mentioned in the newspapers. Oh, no, <laughs> you are being morbid, sir. <laughs> Is there a plan C? Yes. Now, Jeff, 
You and I will evaluate this chap Fleming when I talk to him again, and we'll give ourselves a deadline. If we decide to try and do any mid-air engineering at all, I say we need a minimum time allowance of four hours. Agreed? Yeah, agreed. But who's going to tackle the job? I mean, I can't squeeze my fat body down there, and Perkins is a navigator, mm. not an engineer. True. Well, you can write him off. Well, I can't leave the control, so there's only one chance left. Is there one, sir? Yes. See if we can find a passenger volunteer with some engineering experience. Hardly a chance in a million. We haven't even looked for a volunteer yet. So, is it plan A or B? Or should we keep an open mind until you've heard from Fleming on the RT? If he has a plan, well, it had better be good, that's all I can say. No, oh, I agree with that. Ah, oh, isn't it damn silly? Here she is, flying as sweet as a migrating bird, and all that's wrong is something that hasn't got anything to do with flying at all. Yeah. Pity about Truman. He's had engineering experience. Oh, you can bet about him. He's cracked up. How a bloke like that gets past a psychiatrist beats me. Hey, you know, Jeff, I'm beginning to wonder what really happened on that check flight. The one that grounded Fleming? Yes. Now, one of them's been lying. Now, switch on the RT, Jeff, will you? Sir. I'm ready to have another chat to the customers, and then I'll talk to Fleming again. Well, the captain sounded very calm and collected. Air pocket? Not on your life. Then what made the aircraft pitch upwards like that? I don't know, Dr. Rogers, but it scared me stiff. That doesn't make you original. Take a look around. Yeah. Valentine's going to have apoplexy by the look of him. And Miss Tyne had a shard of liquor all over the place she's studying. She's pretty calm, though. She looks annoyed. But most of the passengers seem frozen stiff. Shock. They'll chatter like magpies in a minute or two. Jonas! Jonas! Where the hell is she? While you've been talking to Crook, Robert, I've been studying the drawings of State Line's Jet 446. Oh, Greg, so what? I see you've made some notes. Yes, a rough outline of what I think could be done. If Crook reports back that it, it's his aircraft that has lost a wheel. Yes, if he's been damaged, and I'm sure he has, it means that if he commits himself to my plan, there's no way back. It'll be a difficult decision for the captain to make. Oh, just a minute, Robert. I promised I'd phone Ken Woodford when I got here. Oh. Excuse me, will you? Yes, yeah, sure. Get me Bresham 5-4, please. Do you know Dawlish? No. He's a director of the airline. Oh. He's making things difficult for Scrivens. After all, it, this isn't a ministry decision. All Scrivens can officially do is make sure that every possible aid is given to Captain Crook. Yes, well, of course, this always... Greg here. Any fresh news from Crook? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, Dawlish is being a nuisance. He's been on the RT to Crook saying he mustn't trust anybody. I see. Um, uh, Fleming with you? Uh, yes, Ken. Is he all right? I'll let you know in a few minutes. I'll ring you back. All right. Well, Robert, uh, be ready with your technical stuff as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. By the time I've dealt with Dawlish and his idiot barrier, there won't be much time left. Oh, incidentally, I saw that girl Julie in the corridor just now. What's she doing here? Ken Woodford asked her to come here. Oh, why? He thought she could help me. Not a hope. Why are you so useless with women, Robert? There was one, only one, who was any good for you, and you dropped her like a hot potato. Well, if you mean Claire, she wanted me to go. I suppose you would think that. Of course, if you give a girl the idea you may cut your throat, what's she supposed to do? Hide all the kitchen knives? Oh, she spoke to you about all the... Yes, but I'm not going to talk about your love life now. We haven't time. Just remember this. When you talk to Crook again, he's one of State Line's best captains. Don't apologize for yourself. I prefer you to speak to him. I bet you would. Nothing doing. How many more flying hours, Perkins? Allowing for letdown, uh, four hours and 35 minutes. Right. That leaves no reserve for diversion. Uh, do you agree, Jeff? Yes. I make it four and a half with a bit to spare. I see. So if at all, we don't try any repair work for another 35 minutes. 
What's cooking downstairs? Well, roughly speaking, this chap, Greg, is backing Fleming. Scrivens, the ministry man, is backing Dawlish, a state line director. Oh. Oh, by the way, how's Truman? Well, according to Susan, he's very odd. Dr. Rogers is doing what she can to keep him under sedation. Get on the intercom and ask Susan to come up here. Right, sir. Do you know this chap, Dawlish, well, Captain? Miss Eccles. Yes. Well, what do you think of him? He's a director of the company. Oh. That's what I think of him. Ah, Susan, there you are. Now, you might be able to help. Yes, Captain. All this hoo-ha between Truman and Fleming. What do you know about it? Sir, I, um, I don't know what to think. Now, you've met Fleming. What do you make of him? Pretty nasty, I thought. He was absolutely ruthless about Jimmy Truman, especially about his flying. Why? There's a girl called Julian. It's all mixed up with her. Well, how does she come into the picture? You see, sir, Jimmy was involved with another girl as well. Two women at once? Yes. So there were battles between Truman and Fleming? Yes, sir. How? I did hear Fleming tell Truman once that flying an aeroplane wasn't a battle for supremacy. Mm. And he said something about fighting him on the controls. Right. If that means anything. What? It means plenty. Truman say anything? Yes. Well, he, he quoted a Greek saying, to destroy a man, find his weakest point, for therein lies the source of your own triumphs. Oh, you, I have a feeling I'd like a breath of clean, fresh air. And so would I. I knew Truman fancied himself as a Don Juan, but I never thought he was such a blackguard. All right, Susan, thanks. Very good, sir. Well, what now, sir? I'm going to call London Airport. Hand me the mic, please. Brought you some coffee, Robert. Oh, Julie, I. I thought you'd gone home. I changed my mind. Oh. Well, that's encouraging. I saw Mr. Gregg a few minutes ago. Did he talk to you? Yes. Have you heard any more about Jimmy? Only what I told you. He's Crook's co pilot. Uh, but Scrivens has been on the radio to Crook. Jimmy's cracked up. Cracked up? What do you mean? All I know is he lost control of himself and was ordered out of the cockpit. What? Well, you don't seem to care. I expected you to be pleased. At a time like this, Crook's going to need all the help he can get. Anyway, it isn't going to make any difference to the situation between you and me. Robert, don't you really remember what happened on that check flight? Well, I'd hardly fake amnesia when I've everything to gain by remembering. Unless you weren't sure you had. What are you suggesting? Well, you know perfectly well already. Didn't the doctor say there's no such thing as amnesia? He didn't go as far as that. I don't remember him calling me a liar. Yet I believe you are. The wrong way round. The wrong way round? What the devil are you talking about? You said it yourself. You'd hardly fake amnesia if you had everything to gain by remembering. Don't people forget what they most fear? Oh, but that's absolutely... Childish? All right, it's childish. But it would be even more childish to go on as you are. Now, uh, no, no, wait a minute. Jimmy had the controls. He had the controls because he panicked and couldn't control himself. And it wasn't possible for me to restore things any other way than make Jimmy control the aircraft and... Therefore control himself. Yes. Yes. Then, through that sudden loss of altitude, I must have passed out. When we landed, they found me half-conscious and Jimmy in command. But you couldn't tell them how it happened. Why? because I'd lost all my pride. Over me? Yes. Well, now, Julie, you... you better go home. Um, uh, I have a meeting. I've, I've got to think. Uh, Greg can't handle that chap Dawlish alone. Rub it. No, 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 no. No, this is something I've got to do on my own. And that's the latest radio from Captain Crook, Mr. Dawlish. You've seen this, Mr. Fleming. Yes, Mr. Dawlish. I have a pretty good idea now what the damage is and what on-the-spot repair work should be attempted. Greg, as head of the manufacturing company, what's your view? Fleming is the only engineer available who knows the aircraft inside out and who knows what might be attempted to repair the damage. Maybe, but it isn't up to us to decide Captain Crook's proper course of action. Obviously not, but Crook is open to suggestion. Mm, very sensible of him. But it's up to me, as a director of state lines, to ensure that the suggestion comes from the appropriate quarter. You have talked on the radio to Captain Crook. I have, Mr. Fleming. You felt obliged to tell him that, in your opinion, 
I was in no condition to offer advice. Mm, I'm afraid that's so. But don't you think that any engineering ideas I put forward might be assessed on their own merit? The matter of who puts forward opinions to Captain Crook is one of the utmost importance, not to mention the motives for doing so. But surely, sir, my motives are obvious, Mr. Dawlish. Well, what are your motives, Mr. Fleming? The same as yours and mine, Mr. Dawlish, to help Captain Crook in every possible way. Mm -hmm, quite so, Scrivens, quite so. But Mr. Fleming is a discredited pilot. Oh, Surely his motive is to make a comeback. That's totally uncalled for. Oh, yes, Greg, we all know that Fleming's one of your bright young men. Look, we're all getting head up and time's running short. Let's stick to the point. Very well, Scrivens. Well, my point is that it isn't so much the plan, it's the man. You pick your own men, Dawlish? Yes. You pick Truman? Yes, and didn't you find him acceptable? I did, a mistake. So we were both wrong about him, weren't we? It's by no means clear what happened up there tonight. Oh, come off it, Dolly. The captain slung Truman out of the cockpit. And the man you're asking the captain to trust was also slung out of a cockpit when he lost his nerve and had to let Truman take over. Mr. Gregg, did you believe the report that Truman filed against Fleming? I had to accept it. What do you think now? I think, Scrivens, you should ask Fleming direct. I'm sure he'll tell the truth. Well, Fleming? Well, uh... There was something weird about Truman that day. Oh, I admit, I handled him badly. As I say, there was something weird about him which I didn't see in time. Well, when I did, he snapped out of it and got us down safely. He got you down? Well, why him? Various reasons. I'll tell you later, not now. The safety of the aircraft and ourselves depended on his recovery from panic. You're asking us to believe that. Well, why didn't you say so at the time? Well, that is a question which only a psychiatrist can answer. Oh, so we have no proof that you're of sound mind now? None. Except your own judgment. Your plan means that if Captain Crook lowers his undercarriage and it fails to lock down and align the wheels, he'll be even worse off than he is now. Perfectly right, sir. You see, if the shuttle valve uh, fails to... There's no to... good baffling me with technicalities. We're discussing a simple decision, yay or nay. If your engineering ideas are wrong, what are Crook's chances of landing his passengers safely? Not very good. I mean, are they better or worse than they would be if Crook ditched in the sea or, or landed on his belly? Probably worse. Well, I think Crook would put your plan third and last within three possible chances. It's a natural instinct of a captain to follow his own bent. He knows he has a sporting chance of ditching her, but maybe anything up to the odds of ten to one against. Crook is open to persuasion, but he must be sure that those who advise him on the ground have confidence in me. Ah! Yes, and at the moment, my reputation stinks to high heaven. And you didn't do much to reverse this when you spoke to Crook on the radio. Do you blame me? Well, I'm asking you now to change your opinion. On what basis? Experts have been told about Fleming's plan. Very well, Scrivens. And what's their verdict? At first, they were doubtful whether the repair job could be done in the air. They're now divided in their opinions. Well, what do you say to that, Greg? Nobody has said that what Fleming proposes is impossible. It's got to be a lot better than possible. Well, exactly, Fleming. And you think it is, Fleming? If there is a man aboard that aircraft who can carry out certain repairs and use the tools available, then yes, Scrivens. And my proposals offer a better chance of safely landing that Jet 4 than any other method that has been considered. I'll buy that. You agree, Mr. Dawlish? Well, uh, really, I, I don't know. Look, Fleming isn't making any promises, Dawlish. We can ask Crook on the radio if there is such a person aboard. The decision will still be Crook's. We're only here to advise him, but we must be unanimous. Will you go along with us, Dawlish? I withdraw my objections. Thank you, sir. We have decided, gentlemen, on the right course. I am, after due consideration, in full agreement. Good. Then let's go to the radio room and tell Crook. On the contrary, Mr. Hub. You're an open book. You'll settle down and marry and rear children until you're blue in the face. Oh, if you know that about me, Doctor, it's a pretty damn depressing forecast. I wonder what you thought of Truman when you first talked to him. You're predictable. Others are not. I dare say that Mr. Truman might have struck me as immature if I'd examined him at his last medical. But then so do you. Ouch! <laughs> You'll get over it. You seem to know what I'm going to do next. I hope so. Do you own a car? Yeah. Well, why do you ask? What do you do when it goes wrong? Take well, it to a garage? No, as a matter of fact, I like to do my own repairs. You're a bit of a mechanic, in fact. In a kind of way, Doctor. 
Say, I, I feel pretty silly calling you doctor. Don't lady doctors have first names? On special occasions, yes. My name's Dulcie. Well, amateur motor mechanics have names, too. Mine's Jack. Tell me about your practical experience, Jack. Well, uh, I went up to the auto center while I was in England to find out how to soup up my latest. They taught me one hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. Boy, when I've operated on my she-devil, she'll go like a bat out of hell. <laughs> how predictable is that? That's exactly what I hoped. Only better. I don't understand. Oh, I'm sorry, but it was necessary to make sure. When I was asked to go forward a few minutes ago to see the captain, he told me that he may need a volunteer for a certain purpose. Ah. I said I thought you might be suitable. I could tell by your hands that you were used to mechanical work of some kind. I'll get him manicured. Seriously, you think I could be of some use? Now that I've talked to you, yes. Well, what sort of job do they want done? Go and talk to the captain. He's expecting you. Right, but I won't try and kid you. I'm scared. You'd be a bit of an idiot if you weren't. Hey, you. Mr. First Officer Truman, isn't it? Hmm? Mind if I sit down next to you and talk? No. That little bitch Susan the stewardess won't answer the bell. I want a drink. You want one? No. Awful world we live in. You know, we've turned back. Ruined a deal I hope to pull through in Washington. Fact is, I'll be broke. All because of some bug in this aircraft. <laughs> Might as well shoot myself. You look as if you're fed up with this life, too. Yeah. Oh, I must have a drink. I must have a drink, my nerves. Where is that little bitch? Susan! Susan! Stewardess! Susan. Yes, Dr. Rogers. That last drink you took to Mr. Valentine, how did it affect him? Well, it seems to have quietened him. Oh, At least he stopped shouting and swearing and trying to make Mr. Truman talk. And Mr. Truman? Oh, that sedative you gave him has almost sent him to sleep. Is Mr. Hubb still in the cockpit? Yes, he is. Dr. Rogers, Mr. Perkins told me just now that Mr. Hubb seems to be a bit of an engineer. He says he's volunteered to try to do some repairs. Do you know exactly what it is he's going to do? All I know is that they're fixing up a long lead to the radio so that Mr. Hubb can talk to someone at London Airport who will tell him how to make the repairs. Mr. Hubb will be working in Number 3 Systems Bay, so the captain will be able to talk to him too. That's the tunnel that runs right along the aircraft under the floor, isn't it? Yes, yes, I think so. I know there's something wrong with this aircraft, but I wonder what it is and, and how serious. Look, the light over the loudspeaker. The captain's going to talk to the passengers. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen rather carefully to what I'm going to say, because you will all know by now that there's a bit of a snag with this aircraft, and I don't want you to get the idea that things are worse than they really are. And that's why I'm going to tell you the facts. As a flying machine, I want to assure you that there is nothing whatsoever wrong with this aeroplane. She's in excellent form. And if we didn't have to land somewhere, sometime, there wouldn't be any problem. However, it gets monotonous if we don't come down sooner or later, and we prefer not to run out of fuel before we arrive somewhere. When we took off from London Airport, one of those rare faults occurred to do with the undercarriage wheels, which now means that we are faced with some difficulty in landing in the normal way. I can tell you now that myself and the rest of the crew, together with expert engineers on the ground, have worked out a means whereby the undercarriage can be repaired in flight. I hope you will forgive us for the inconvenience caused to you. We are now going to descend to an altitude suitable for the work that has to be done. Now, it may be a bit bumpy. If any of you feel the air a, a little rarefied for comfort, you can, as I told you before, obtain oxygen by pressing the red button overhead. It's all free. Thank you for listening. I shall be saying a few words later. That's all for now. Well, well, I thought you were going to end up by telling them to take their partners for the next dance. Oh, good heavens, did I ever do it, Jeff? Well, it uh, <laughs> might be an idea to play some music over the speakers. Oh, Perkins, if you walked into your bank to ask for an outrageous overdraft, would you put on a brand new suit? <laughs> <laughs> Look, you must never gild a lily, old boy. It makes people wonder why it's so necessary. I'll remember that. I'm going to need an overdraft pretty soon. Oh, why? My wife wants me to buy a house. Oh, Struth, at a time like this, Jeff, he has to go all domestic on me. 
Well, Perkins, just don't forget to put the stairs in like some friends of mine did in the heat of the moment. Oh, very funny. <laughs> Fleming will be calling us any minute now, Joe. I'll have everything ready, sir. What about the emergency axe? I'll grab one from the bulkhead. The one here's too big. He isn't her back from the loo yet? No, he's talking to Susan. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Rogers was right when she said he was predictable. <laughs> do you think he can do the job, Jeff? In the time we have left? Well, according to Fleming, Hub faces a hell of a complicated program, mm -hmm. including locating the correct place in the flooring of number three systems bays and cut through it with an axe. No mean task, that. Eventually, if all goes well, he'll tell you when the time has come for you to lower the undercarriage. The moment when there's no going back. Well, let's, uh, let's skip the details, hmm? Now, if we can get the wheels locked down, the job is to get the wheels facing fore and aft. Mm, I've allowed half an hour per side for that. The bogies are eccentrically pivoted, aren't they? Yeah, but the slipstream will force them hard up against the stop. Hmm? See, getting enough leverage is going to be the problem. So that leaves us with a time problem, then? Yeah, but we forgot one factor. Hmm? The extent to which it matters depends on Hub and the capacity of his lungs. Altitude. The rarefied air will slow him down. Yeah, and he can't wear a mask. It'll impede him too much. How much would our fuel consumption increase if we flew lower? Oh, she'd drink fuel like a dried-up camel at an oasis. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Switch on the intercom. Yes, sir. Thanks. Oh, Susan, would you ask Dr. Rogers to come in and see me at once? Thank you. What's the idea, sir? Well, if Hub can't wear a mask, there's a chance the doctor can help him. Ah. You sent for me. Uh, Dr. Rogers, at a guess, what's the physical condition of Jack Hub, would you say? I can't answer that for certain without examining him. Yeah, well, there isn't time. We're up against the clock. Hub will have to work fast. You're thinking of the rarefied air? Yes. Oh, it'll slow him down, especially on a long job. A four-hour job. That's a long time. Of course, there are certain stimulant drugs that would help. Have you got any? No. Now, how the devil do we find out if any of the passengers have some without alarming them all? Uh, when does Jack Hub have to start the job? Three minutes. I'll go now and see what I can do. Do you ever pray, sir? Eh? Do you ever pray? <laughs> As a matter of fact, you just caught me at it. There's some minutes to go before you're talking the radio to Crook, so I'd like to talk to you, Robert. Please do, Greg. Dawlish was impressed by you at the conference. Oh, I'm not letting that fool me. If I last out the next four hours, it'll be something of a miracle. It was something of a miracle that Captain Crook discovered that young Hud had some engineering experience. When he was telling me on the radio, I really crossed my heart. I hope Hub knows enough to understand the instructions I give him. And I hope I last the course. Oh, look. Oh, you know damn well, Greg, that people don't make startling recoveries from my sort of illness. I'm not sure that you aren't just sorry for yourself, to be quite frank. And, oh, well, forget it. Go on, Greg. You needn't mince matters. You're like a man with a stammer. You trip over yourself when there's no need, no damn need at all. That isn't what the doctor thought when I was grounded. So the medical report really interests you? It would. If there was any hope of my being able to fly again. Now, first things first, Robert. Supposing this plan of yours fails through no fault of your own. I'm not considering failure. Quite right. Nevertheless, you mustn't make a life or death issue out of it for yourself. That's just using it. Using it? Then you think the same as Dawlish. No, no, Dawlish can't see the wheat from the chaff. I know you do the best job that can be done. So the issue of why you are doing it doesn't really matter so far as the aircraft is concerned. But a doctor doesn't give up practice because a patient dies of an incurable disease. Yet that's what you would do, given the chance. Greg, if that undercarriage can't be fixed, I don't believe I can be either. Then you'd better make out. Right. Here you are, Robert. You're hooked up by radio. Now get on with it. Right. Hello? Uh, my name is Robert Fleming, Mr. Hub. I'm afraid we've never been formally introduced. So I think it would be a good idea if we started off by you telling me something about yourself. Any luck, Dr. Rogers? Sorry, no. I see. 
I've talked to all the passengers. You'd think they'd never taken so much as bicarbonate of soda, the indignant way they reacted to my question. I had an idea that chap Valentine might have been carrying the sort of stimulants we need for Hub. Oh, Valentine gets his out of a bottle. Uh, how is he? Drunk. Uh-huh. And very indignant when I asked him if he had any hexamin tablets, and then lecherous. Oh, that man thinks he can pop into bed with any woman he meets. I suppose Jack Hub has started on the job? Yes. He got into the Three Systems Bay without too much trouble. He's got a radio headset on a long lead. He's in radio touch with that chap Fleming. They seem to have gotten on to each other. Is he all right? Oh, yes. yes. You were right, Doctor. Predictable. Plenty of guts. I'm not worried about him. No sign of altitude fatigue? Not so far. Uh, I think you'd better listen to Fleming and Hub, Captain. They sound a bit edgy to me. Perhaps you can cut in a referee. Right, Jeff. Give me the headphones. Hub! Yeah? You oaf! I said cut along the line opposite frame number 582. This is 582. How can it be? You say you exposed the hydraulic pipe. Yeah? Well, you're lucky you didn't hack your way straight through it. Look again, man. Yeah, all right. I have it. Marvelous. Now mark the line with a punch. There isn't time. What do you want, then? A can opener? I'll have to guess the line. No, mark it off, Hub. You won't gain time by taking chances. Okay. Wow, it's cold down here. Cut out the weather reports. Think about the job. You should be here. Sorry, can't make it. Done yet? Yeah. Now start cutting. No half measures. Okay. And tell me what you see as you cut. I prize the metal up. I, I'm looking down now. Yeah, I can push the flashlight through. What can you see? Looks like the locking gear. Can you slice off the metal panel you've cut without cutting into any cables? Yeah. Off with it, then. Captain. Yes, Jeff? I think Fleming is pushing him too much. <laughs> no, Jeff. He's like a good attitude. He's trying to make Hub more annoyed than frightened, and providing he keeps it up, it'll work. Well, Fleming made a bad start, sir. He wasted nearly ten minutes talking to Hub. That wasn't time wasted, Jeff. Look what he found out. Hub responds to challenge, but no soft soaping. He's a bit sulky about taking orders because he's a rich young man. But when he finds he's got to, he accepts them. Now, he likes Susan, and he's thinking of her in the back of his mind. Hub's a bit of a stallion, you know, who's hard to break. Yeah. But he knows he's got to be a lot less wild if he's going to be useful. Now, Fleming assessed this in ten minutes. It's not bad going. Now, let's listen to him again. Well, that's done. Piece of sheet metal. Anybody want it? Keep it as a souvenir. Now, is your rope secure? Yeah, it's okay. It had better be, because if you slip, those undercarriage doors will give right under you. Now, look at the starboard locking gear. Is there a lot of slipstream blowing up? Yeah, half a gale. A lot of fluid around, too. Only one jaw engaged. The other isn't biting. Now, listen. When the captain lowers the undercarriage, can you see a way of getting down? You won't be able to stand on the doors, but you've got to be able to work with your hands. Oh, where will the knee joint be relative to the hull? Just inside it. Uh, I, I think I can kneel just by the hinge of the door. There's not much room, though. But enough. <sighs> There's going to have to be. That's the spirit. But look, I tell you what we'll do. I want to change the order of events a bit so that you can take the other side as far as this. Okay. Uh, I feel... What's the matter? Kind of dizzy. Put your head between your knees. Fleming, Crook speaking. Sorry to butt in. Hub will be all right. Just wait a minute. Very well. I'm going to have a word with my engineer. Call you back in a few moments. Hang on. Very well. Hub's beginning to feel dizzy. But what the hell can we do, sir? Hub can't last out if he's feeling dizzy already. No, he won't. You know, Dr. Rogers has a suspicion that that tipsy tycoon Valentine may have got some, something useful on him, but he won't confess hexamine or something like that. It would help Hub a lot. We could search, Valentine. Oh, see what you can do, Jeff. Yes, sir. I'm going to get Fleming again. Hello, Fleming. Hold it, Captain. Hub's talking. Sorry. I felt faint. I'm better now. Good, good. But uh, take it easy for a bit longer. You were telling me earlier about a girl named Susan. Where did you meet her? She's an air hostess. Nice. 
Very. How long have you known her? About five hours. Oh, fast worker, eh? <laughs> I take it she's on board? Right, she is. And let's get back to work. Okay. You feel up to it? Yeah. Right, well, mark off the panel to be cut on the port side. Only be sure to get the right frame number this time. What did you say, Truman? My body has never belonged to me. I feel that way at times. Huh? Who are you? Don't you remember? Name's Valentine, a passenger. Where are we? We're on an airplane. Oh, yes. Yes. Flight 46 and... Oh, yes, I'm the first officer. I ought to get back to the flight deck. Are you sure you want to go back? What do you mean? I mean, do you like the crew, the captain, all that? Oh, no. I don't like the crew. <laughs> they wear suits. And they think they're men. What are they really? Victims. Ah. They have ugly bodies, so they try to destroy mine. But what they don't know is uh, my body doesn't belong to me anyway. Doesn't belong to you? No. It belongs in Sparta. Long, long ago. And then I found it. And liked it. So it became mine. <laughs> of course, they in the cockpit, they can't find a body like mine. So they have to put up with what they have. Crook and Simmons and Perkins. And the bodies they have will grow old. Old. And yours, Truman, will stay young. Yes. Now, if I can think of a way... I think I know a way. Let's have a drink before I explain. tread from the port undercarriage lock. It's no good, Fleming. I can't shift it. How long is the steel bar you're using? Uh, I guess about four feet. Are you using it as a lever? I'm trying. I can't get a grip on it. Now rest a bit. Take your time. Time, Jim. Time? Yes, sir. But Fleming's right. It won't help if he panics hub about valuable minutes being lost. Can we start those engines a bit more, Jeff? If we fly any slower, Captain, the drag will increase. We won't gain anything. Well, we could sling off some baggage, but it wouldn't make enough difference to justify the commotion. No, we can't even chuck the nastiest passenger overboard. Oh, I don't see why not. Of course, they might fall on somebody. Steer five degrees left onto 075. 075, and jolly good luck all round. Hello, Hub's talking again. Listen, sir. Trouble is, rubbers. Wrapped itself around the lug into a tight flong. You won't do it with that bar. Uh, look, is there a pair of Tinker's claws in the toolbox? Yeah, yeah, I have them. Good. Are they long enough to reach down to the lock? Uh, no, I can't reach. Well, now, look, there, there's a strut that runs across the after end of the undercarriage doors. It'll take your weight easily, only don't slip. Climb down onto that and then see if you can use the claws. But be careful. And let me know when you get there. Uh, Hop, can you hear me? I keep, keep feeling dizzy. Spots in front of my eyes. I can make it. <laughs> Good lad. Be careful. Okay, Fleming. I'm there. I I've got a grip on the rubber. Fine. We'll count it down together, Jack. Say when you're ready. Right. Ready. Right. One. One. Two. Two. Almost, but not quite. Next time should do it, then. Uh, uh, I'll have to stop a moment, get my breath back. <laughs> yeah, very well, but we'd better not stop too long, old chap. You know how bored the passengers can get. Now, well, Greg, you heard. Harvey's getting weaker. I heard, Robert, I heard. And we're nearly 15 minutes behind. No, no. Oh, keep still, Scrivens. Don't fidget. I'm sorry. Are you still going through with this, Fleming? It's up to Captain Crook. 
If he wants to override this, he'll come through on the radio and say so, but I can't ask him myself. Why not? There's the hookup from the cockpit radio to Hub's headset. If Hub heard me, that would completely scupper his morale if Crook wanted to go on with this plan. We could call Crook on the other frequency. That way Hub wouldn't hear. What do you think, Scrivens? Uh, no, I agree with Fleming. Leave it to Crook. He must be just as aware of the problem as we are. Uh, perhaps uh, so. Uh, right. Hold it. Here's Hub on the air again. Okay, Fleming. I'm ready for another attempt. We've had enough of attempts. Damn you! To hell with your smugness! You're safe on the ground! I'm doing the job! That sounded like energy! Use some of that! I'll use it! One, two, three. We made it! Well done. Very well done. Now, climb back into the systems bay. We're all set to get the undercarriage down. Captain Crook, can you hear me? Yes. This is it. If you give the order to lower the gear, it's hell or bust from now on. The choice is yours. Thanks, Fleming. We'll go through with it. It's your aeroplane. Don't worry. Even in the very best surgery, you have to take a few chances. <laughs> Would you say the odds are in your favor? In theory, no. In practice, I think Jack Hub will manage somehow. Without pills? Somehow. I've never lost my faith in the illogical. How are tricks, Jack? Just got clear of the undercarriage. Captain Crook, you heard? I heard. I'm going to lower the gear now. Captain. Yes, Jeff. Hydraulic pressure dropping. The wheels are down, the hydraulic fluid is drained from both tanks. Right. Now, oh, we've committed ourselves, Jeff. Four million quid's worth of machinery and 70 passengers and crew... Yes, sir. ...imperiled because one lousy wheel rim penetrated its own gut. As you say, Captain, just one lousy wheel. Must you start to eat another of those blasted bananas, Perkins, oh, no. now of all time? That would be a good way, Truman. What do you think? Yes. Yes. The key to my immortality, Valentine. The gods are on my side. The instrument of retribution is in the cockpit. It hangs on two hooks. It's waiting for me, Valentine. Waiting for me. The axe. And go to the cockpit and use it. And we'll both forgive life for what it has done to us. Go on, Drew. Yes. Go on. Go on. Go on. Hub's in a bad way down there, Jeff. Yeah. It's bad luck Valentine had no pills. Sounds as if he's being sick. Yeah. Truman. Look out, sir. What? Hey, Truman, put that axe down. Now, come on, Truman, give me the axe. Come on. Look out! Look out! You go it for a rabbit! No, no, Pull it back! Pull it back! I'm doing it for you! Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out of here! Captain Crook? Captain Crook? Hub? Hello? Hello, Flight 46? Hello? No answer? No, Greg. That noise we heard before the radio cut out. Well, Scrivens, what did it sound like to you? Well, nothing I could interpret. Fantastic row. Well. Who was it yelled, look out? It wasn't Crook. Try the radio again, Robert. Captain Crook? Hub? Fleming calling? Hello, Fleming. Oh. Crook here. Sorry for delayed answering. Oh, glad to hear you. We heard someone yell, look out, and then a damned awful noise. We were wondering what hit you. Nothing. Near miss. Truman went berserk. Grabbed the emergency axe in the cockpit and tried to smash the instrument panel. What? Oh, Lord. He's off his head. Nuts. Oh, God. Truman, man. Go on, Captain. Well, Jeff Simmons spotted him just in time and warned me. I had to work fast. Get him off balance, so I put the aircraft into a steep bank. I thought the wings would snap off, but they flipped back safely. And Truman? Toppled over and split his head open on the edge of the racks. Nasty mess. Quite, quite bloody. Literally. Is he unconscious? No, he's dead. Oh, do you know? Are the passengers behaving? Yes. And Jack Hub? Well, he's in a bad way. But he'll be all right again when Susan gets to him. Susan, the stewardess? Yes. 
We found some pills on Truman, not on Valentine. And a doctor who's one of the passengers says they're just the thing to put Hub on his feet again. Yes, but the stewardess, can she get to him? She's slim. And she fancies Hub. <laughs> Shouldn't be surprised if Cupid hasn't lost an arrow or two. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must say a few words to the passengers. They deserve a nice fireside chat. They've been very good, all things considered. Over. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain speaking. It would be idle to pretend that the lurch you felt a few minutes ago never happened. I have a backache to prove it, and I expect some of you have, too. However, that's over, and we're still flying. I want you to realize that we do maneuvers a great deal more amusing than that one in the course of our check flights, and we've never managed to get one of these things to fall apart. As yet. I promise you a smoother time from now on. I'll give you more information in a few minutes. Thank you. Whoa, much more of that, Captain. You'll have the passengers passing the hat round for you. Well, I tried to cheer them up, Jeff. Have you any comments to make, Braggins? Have a banana, sir. Oh, I don't oh, believe it. No. <laughs> Switch on the radio, Jeff, and let's hear if Fleming yeah. and Hub are still on speaking terms. So, cheer up, Jack. Your girlfriend Susan's on her way with some pep pills. How do you feel? Up to some light electrical work. Yeah, I think so, Fleming. Good. Have a look around and locate electrics panel number 18. Yeah, I have it. How many external contacts has it got? Uh, seven. And that isn't it. You have your left hand on it now. Uh, how the hell did you know that? <laughs> Remind me to tell you sometime. The contacts are color-coded. You want blue and yellow and green and yellow. Yeah, yeah, I have them. Now connect a piece of insulated wire to each. But whatever happens, don't let the two wires touch. So the other jobs I'm going to ask you to do are completed, because if those wires touch prematurely, then you'll jam everything, and the wheels won't lock into the fore and aft position. Understand, Jack? Yeah, I understand. So it'll be best not to bear the ends of those wires until we're ready to make contact. That way you will be perfectly safe. Have your pliers ready. Okay. Oh, hang on. Susan's just got here with the pills. <laughs> What's the joke? <laughs> Susan says they're dangerous if you take more than two. Dangerous how? I'm supposed to make one feel... Very loving. And as soon as she gets back to her normal work and you get on with the jobs I want you to do, the better for all of us. I wonder. Robert, are you feeling faint again? Mm, no. No, Greg, just... just difficult to concentrate. For heaven's sake, pull yourself together. You're Hub's eyes and hands. You've got to know what he's doing as he does it. Fleming! Listen, Hub's calling you. Captain Fleming, can't you hear me? Are you receiving me? Yes. Yes, Jack, you're... Coming over quite clearly, hardly any static. Well, for heaven's sake, what do I do now? Do? Do what? Didn't you understand what I said? J just after Susan left me, I caught my foot in the locking jaws, and I can't free myself without using the jury strap. Try and use it. I can't reach the strut. Are you in pain? No, but what shall I do? What shall I do? Uh, hold on a minute, Jack. I, I must study the drawings again. I I'll think up something to help you. Hurry. Time's running out on us, and I'm freezing. Robert. Yes, Greg? Let me down now, and you'll never show your face again in a man's suit of clothes. Talk to Hub. Sound cheerful and think, man. Think. Uh, yes, yes. Hub, are you getting me? Yes, clearly. Have you tried getting clear by leaving your shoe behind? Yeah. No good. The pressure's too tight. Is there any hydraulic fluid on the floor? It's lousy with it. Where exactly is the strut you want to use as a lever? I mean, relative to your position. It's about six feet to the left. Starboard side? Yeah. Stand by, Jack. Captain Crook, did you get that? Yes. Then will you swing your aircraft round to the left without banking her? That way the strut should slide across the floor towards Hub. <laughs> You're a cunning devil, Fleming. Good idea. Jeff? Mike, please. Switch on to the cabin loudspeakers. I must have a word with the customers. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to maneuver this aircraft rather sharply. Nothing to worry about, but hang on to your drinks. Never waste liquor. Now, Jeff, give me full throttle. I don't want to stall her, and we need quite a whip round to make that strut slide towards half. Over to you, Blaine. Right. Now, Jack, be ready to catch the end of the strut. Yeah. Otherwise, it'll go clean through the undercarriage doors. Carry on, Captain Crook.
Screw this! Screw this! Where the hell is that girl? Uh, oh, who are you? I, sir, am the engineer officer of this aircraft. I want the stewardess, not you. Go. Now, look, I... no further alcohol, Valentine. Captain's orders. What? According to Dr. Rogers and other witnesses, you were heard talking to Truman before he attempted to sabotage this aircraft. What of it? No crime to talk to a man, is it? You were heard to incite Truman to act as he did. If you don't behave, you're going to be handcuffed. You'll be questioned more fully when we land. I don't give a damn. And there are a good many matters concerning this flight which I personally shall report to the airport police. As you please, sir. But from now on, behave. Uh... Well, Jeff, how did Valentine react? Uh, bluffs and threats, sir, but he's cowed. He won't give any more trouble. He'd better not. Can you give me an exact figure for fuel, Jeff? How long did it last out? Yeah, I've worked it out, allowing for a steep letdown and a straight run approach. 22 minutes. Right. Well, I want you back in the co-pilot seat now. Thank you, sir. We'll uh, do our pre-landing checks good and early. Just carry out the drills. I'll take the throttles. Right, sir. Now, what happens if Hub doesn't make it? Do we calculate on the same fuel reserve? Over and above the 22-minute deadline? Yes. Well, sir, I've had to think of the residents in the London airport area. You know, if we ran Yes, dry. yes, of course, Jeff, yes, yes. These flow meters are usually accurate, and I haven't allowed for what may be slopping about in the tanks unaccounted for. Well, I don't propose to go plowing up a row of houses trying to prove that your gauges are over-pessimistic. We go down regardless. And what about Hub? Now, uh, he must be out of the three systems bay by the time we reach the outer marker. He deserves the same chance as everybody else, better, if anything. And he's in the wrong place. See, he gets clear when the time comes. Yeah, but how? Oh, Lord knows, he's hopelessly brave. Maybe we can dynamite him out or something. Yes, sir. Uh, hold, hold it, Jeff. Hub's yelling at Fleming. Fleming, can you speak louder? I, I missed that bit. This slipstream's damn noisy. Well, let's recap. Now, tell me the position. The, the legs are locked into place, but the wheels stem them are presented broadside to the direction of flight. So the fork will dig itself in upon landing. Meaning? The aircraft will be flung onto its back. Only 21 minutes to go. Look, Fleming, I'm going to try it with a safety rope. It's the only way. Agreed? Well, the situation is much worse. Worse than it would have been if the undercarriage had been left up and out of the way. I'm afraid the unforeseen has swung the stakes into the outsider range. Uh, an outsider always has a chance. I remember a horse in the Kentucky Derby yes, I made yes, it. you're right. Now, if the outsider is to have a chance, then risk capital must be spent lavishly. How will you do it, Jack? I I'll secure an end to the crank which turns the bogies. Then take the rope round a spare and pull like hell. No, no good. You must get maximum leverage. Use it like a block and tackle. How did you secure the rope at the other end? A round turn, two and a half inches. Well, that'll hold. Undo the rope from your waist, but for God's sake, be careful. Yeah. We need you. Leave the rope secured as it is at the top end. Now take the free end and loop it round the crank. Uh -huh. uh, do you see the groove near the outer end of the crank? Yeah, I have it. Use that. The rope will slip out of the groove. No, not if you pull in the right direction. Use brain as well as brawn, Jack, and get a damn rift on. What's that? Old English expression. Means take your finger out, which is another old English expression. Yeah, we know that one in the States. Nineteen minutes, Jack. I, I can't get enough leverage. There's a goddamn pipe in the way. What color? Pink. That's hydraulics to flaps. Captain Crook. Yeah? Do you mind losing flaps? I'm afraid it's that or nothing. Well, I'm not going to lose them all. I'll take them down halfway first. All right, make it snappy. Jeff, flaps 50%. Aye, aye, sir. Flaps 50 Fleming? Flaps, sir. All right. Right, Captain. Hub, you hear me? Clear as a bell. What's next? Slash that pipe out of your way. And the other one on the starboard side when you get to it. Okay. And keep off the radio from now on. It's up to you. Now, don't forget, you've got to twist those two wires together on electric panel 18. When? When you get the wheel in position. If I do. There's no if about it. Get busy. Over to you, Captain Crook. Thanks. Jeff? Sir. Hand me the graphs. Here you are, sir. I'll have to guess at our load, but it... Must be roughly along this line here with tanks emptied. Perkins. Uh, sir? Does half flap affect the fuel position, do you reckon? Uh, no, sir. Aren't you at the same power setting? Do not make an ass out of your captain. You're quite right. Oh, no. Are you eating another banana? That's the last one, sir. <laughs> Many a true word. Jeff? Sir? 
I make our stalling speed at half flap 121 knots. Agree? What's the margin going to be? Well, let's say five knots. Mm, the stick will shake a bit, but we must take time over the actual touchdown of the weak undercard, and we mustn't run out of runway. We haven't got an undercard yet. No gloom, please. Now, shallow approach. You maintain for 126 knots. Yes, sir. And when I say chop it, now you chop it. Sir. There'll be virtually no flare out, and we just fly her on. Yahoo! Yahoo! Ha! Ah, what the devil? The... Port wheel's in place. I've done it. Well, well, oh. well. I say, Hub. Yeah. Just don't forget the other one, starboard. Not on your sweet life. Jeff, did that bit of news get out on the radio? I don't think so, sir. Hub was told to stay off the radio. Well, I'd better tell Fleming. He might like to know. Ladies and gentlemen, please look at the illuminated sign. Cigarettes out, please. Oh, sorry, Susan. I didn't notice. It's all right, Dr. Rogers. Just a normal precaution before we touch down. Any news of Jack? I'm just going to the cockpit now to find out. A new radar instruction, Captain. Go ahead. Uh, turn left, left onto 120. Hmm. Intercept localizer and report. Uh, cleared for descent at your discretion. Understood, Perkins. Mr. Perkins, can you tell oh, me... Oh, don't ask questions now, Susan. Quiet. Yes. Sorry, sir. Now, we'll have to take it this time round the airport, but I'll spread the turn according to the fuel situation. Right, sir. When we land, we'll have to come in like a blasted rocket. Yeah, a good chance of exploding like one, too. Now, Jeff, no gloom. Plug in and see if Hub is ready to make his getaway. Yes, sir. Fleming may have something to say to him. Greg? Yes, Robert? Crook is turning on to finals now. Undercarriage still unserviceable? Yes. By a blasted millimeter. Can Crook go round? No. Doesn't want to rip up houses. Oh, he's right. Isn't that what you'd decide if you were him? Yes. Hub. Hub, come on, man. And if they don't make it, how will you feel then? Same as you, Greg. You know. It'll be tough after all this. They will have to do something about that undercarriage design. This has all been caused by insufficiently protected equipment. So you warned us two years ago, Robert, and we didn't listen. <laughs> I was told your report was dynamite, and now I know. Hold it. Hold it. Simmons is calling Hub. Hub? Hub! Yeah? Get out of there. Captain's orders. We're crash landing, so get out now. No, I'll be damned if I do. I've got to find the pliers for those two lousy bits of wire first. I dropped them somewhere. Captain, he won't come out. Up to him. What's that has been? Uh, one, two, seven knots, sir. Belly land with all that useless undercarriage hanging down. Don't make me laugh. If Hub can't fix that thing, well, Jeff, this is the big bang. Yes, sir. There are the runway lights now, sir. Nice and clear. Oh, God. Did ever a runway look so short? Mr. Scrivens? Oh, yes. Come in, Forbes. All ready, sir. Runway clear of debris. Fire tenders, ambulances and rescue squads all in position at points you chose along the runway, sir. And beyond the runway? Hell, sir, if she overruns, she'll crash into the radio beam aerial. And if... And if the fuel tanks burst into flame? Mm. I hope not, Forbes. I wonder what it's like, sir. I mean, being the captain. Thinking about it. There are times when one can live ten years in ten minutes. That's what Captain Crook's doing now. Do you think he'll make it, sir? I don't know, Forbes. I can only hope. I came back to the radio room to join Captain Fleming and Mr. Gregg and wait for... Whatever happens. Yes, sir. Go out there and wait till they touch down. I'll come out if I have to. Sir, I... Uh, I pray to God you don't have to. Amen to that, Forbes. Amen to that. One, two, six knots, Jeff. Hold at that. An unholy speed. 
You know, Jeff, this is the closest I've ever been to hitting the approach flights. Six balls for a penny. <laughs> Let's see how many I can knock off. Landing on grass or concrete, sir. If we have to crash, I'll choose the grass. Yes, it looks as if we could take some mowing. Oh, well, what did Susan want? I saw her slip into the cockpit just now. She spoke to you, Perk, didn't she? Oh, something about Hub. She was worried about him. Aha, uh -huh, like that, is it? I thought so. Captain Kirk, Captain! Speaking, Hub, you on your way? I found the pliers. I'm stripping the insulation off the wires. You getting me, Fleming? Yes, good lad, but hurry. There's just time to avoid a belly landing. We are just flying, Fleming. Very close to a store. I'm going on the grass. We are coming up to the approach lights now. He saved the girl from her fate worse than death. <laughs> Father Brunette! Pink! Are you out of your hole, Jack? Nearly. I'm taking off the headset now. It's no use. In the way. As you please, Jack. One thing, Captain. Yes, boy. The next time you almost lose your pants, you can damn well do up your own fly. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last word. I hope not. I'm landing now. And let's hope those blasted bogies stay on the strain. Hey, you, Jeff. Sir. Here we go. And I only hope we don't run out of grass. Well, Robert, how do you feel now? Hmm? Oh, sorry, Greg. I thought it was Julie. Oh, she's waiting for you outside. Well, it was a close-run thing. The Duke of Wellington said something like that after the Battle of Waterloo. That's so. Well, your plan worked. They're down safely, thanks to you. Oh, no, the medals go to Hub and the crew. Agreed, but how do you feel now? Well... I think we ought to strengthen the main bolts that run through the lock casing here and here. <laughs> this cross member will have to be shifted <laughs> forward a bit to allow for larger jaws. And then... Oh, Greg, what's the matter? <laughs> Nothing, Captain Fleming. Nothing at all. In The Higher They Fly by Christopher Hodder Williams, adapted for radio by Norman Edwards, Robert Fleming was played by Peter Clawton, Jack Hubb by Peter Marinka, and Captain Crook by Howard Marion Crawford. Jimmy Truman, Christopher Greatorix, Susan Eccles, Shirley Dixon, Valentine, Barry Keegan, Dr. Dulcy Rogers, Betty Huntley Wright, Simmons, Colin Campbell, Perkins, Gordon Gardner, Scrivens, Patrick Barr, Greg Duncan McIntyre, Forbes Brian Hewlett, Dawlish Frank Partington, Woodford Bruce Beebe, Julie Sheila Grant. The program was first broadcast last Saturday and was produced by John Gibson. <laughs>